In this era of satellite maps, ground level views and even interior views via Google and other organizations, how much information about stadium design should be released to the public? It's an important question. That's really a hot topic all around the country. If you Google most uh, stadiums or even uh, arenas, you can find quite a bit of information. What I think you don't have to release is you shouldn't have to release the schematic of where all your power lines is running or any of your utilities for that matter. Some arenas, indoor arenas that have ice, have certain chemicals there that you may not want certain people to, to be aware of. And the same thing for your stadium. So if you have tunnels under your venue, either your stadium or your arena, you don't necessarily have to release that. That's not information that anybody needs to know. So when you think about what should be publicly available, you should just think about what do people coming to the event really need to know. We believe that the, the CAD drawings, the infrastructure information should not be released to anyone without a valid reason. Because sometimes construction workers need um, that information to do modifications to the, to the facility. We think it's very important to analyze each situation and determine what they really need and what they don't need and only give them the bare minimum. I, I think it's very important that the general public knows that there are security plans, that there are people reviewing security plans for events, but at the same time I think it's just as important that you don't have details about what those security plans are going to be unless it's something that's going to directly impact the public. But I don't think that the general public should have direct information about uh, where a triage area is going to be set up or what a designated uh, evacuation area is going to be or what, where officers or emergency vehicles are going to respond to in the event that something happens because that would allow someone the potential to plant or be able to impact with maybe a secondary device or a secondary attack on the responders. You have two different types of information. You have an emergency action plan that you want the fans to know about. Um, the other plans that include the plumbing, the electrical, and so forth, uh, those you don't, you don't want to uh, let out because someone can take them and learn how to turn things off, learn how to cut power, look at your vulnerabilities by having access to that equipment during game day. Clearly, releasing things that the public can see is, is fine, and that's probably all that's important to release. You know, where, where restrooms are, where concessions are, where uh, your guest services points of, of support are, um, like information booths, where EMS support might be. You know, all of those things are critical. Um, any other aspect, I, I really would keep close to the vest. Certainly all of the back of the house items, um, knowing where the, the operations center is, where the police station is, um, where the home team locker room, visiting team locker room, all of those aspects. Uh, that are behind the, behind the house, I would prefer for the public not to know. Protection. Thinking the unthinkable. Chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, dirty, and conventional explosives are all threats that must be considered, especially since 9-11. Experts agree that the best way to mitigate these threats is detection and intervention early in the process of a plot or threat. One of the most important outcomes of the 9-11 attacks is the way in which local, state, and federal agencies coordinate. I think one of the main things that you have to do is you have to have uh, terrific intelligence. So you have to have ties to the intelligence community, uh, the, the law enforcement community, and, they, and use their ties with FBI and, and other uh, agencies that, that um, uh, have their finger on the pulse of, of uh, terrorism and, and, and safety in the United States. The most important thing to do is to prevent it from happening. I would encourage uh, the design team to include specialists that are attuned to chemical, radiological, and biological threats. For instance, most college campuses have an environmental health and safety division or unit or person designed to monitor that stuff. And I would definitely get those involved in the uh, design process. What are the realities associated with these unthinkable threats? We begin with nuclear devices, dirty bombs, and conventional explosives. Chris Meyer, with security at Texas A&M, has a background in nuclear engineering. The, the nuclear threat is, is one where we're primarily 
concerned about the, the risk of, of dirty bombs. It is a um, technological feat to, to bring a nuclear weapon uh, in, into a stadium. Uh, and so it would be much more likely and much more uh, higher probability that someone would try to bring conventional explosive and surround it with radioactive sources that, that could have been stolen uh, here or abroad uh, and, and blow that up. The greatest threat to life is normally the explosive itself. In a dirty bomb scenario, the radioactive materials tend to cause widespread public panic. So even though they do relatively little harm to most of the people in the vicinity, the real risk would be that you have an overwhelming public fear response. Uh, you have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who want to be surveyed and checked to make sure that they're not contaminated, they don't want to take it home to their family. And so it becomes a true terrorism event where you strike fear into the hearts of, of the masses. For detection of chemical um, and biological and nuclear weapons, uh, you, you want to try to start at the ways into your stadium and into your facility um, because a lot of them you, you want to keep them from getting either even close. So mobile uh, or fixed points on access ways into the stadium parking would be the first step. Second step would be putting monitors fixed to, to the different gates that can pick up the chemicals uh, from a distance. Uh, once they get to the gate, uh, you can start screening and using handheld and, and localized uh, detection equipment to keep that person from making entry in, into that first gate into the facility. Big element in being prepared for emergencies or emergency response is uh, training and partnerships. And so one of the things that we do um, every year at Autzen is that we hold both a tabletop exercise with all of our local, state, um, even federal partners to kind of run through um, the game plan as it is for responding to any type of event. Each year we, we change that up so we've run scenarios on lightning and evacuation. Um, we also then are doing more full-scale um, scenarios and so we have conducted a full-scale full -scale scenario around Seaburnie and worked with the uh, uh, National Guard and the uh, 102nd um, Civil Support Team and regional hazmat groups to give them time um, in the stadium uh, to respond to an actual event. Um, and a lot of that I think is, is uh, important information so that when we talk about elements around design and impingements, by actually exercising with our external partners, giving them the time to run through the motions is, is critical on campus and that's where we learn about ways that we might be able to improve stadium design in the future or update or make small changes um, in response. It's important that you have infrastructure in place at your gate to support detection equipment. That's uh, one, of the, one of the design things that we looked at for the newer parts are the, the power that you need, the resources, the areas to be able to mount or to place items like that in place. Our fire department has currently uh, gotten some equipment that uh, they're able to utilize for their hazmat team that we've uh, multi, we have multiple uses for that. One of those has been for game days, being able to look at any type of chemical activity that may be in the area. But the problem that we ran into was we didn't have a place where we could secure that equipment, which is very expensive. So one of the things you really need to look at is in, when you're looking at your design is a place to be able where it's not only functional but you're able to secure that equipment that you might need for those types of detections. When we first started using uh, radiological and biological detection equipment, the individuals that use that equipment set it up and monitor it for us during the event. A lot of the equipment that they used was really left exposed and other people, patrons, were seeing this equipment. They didn't really know what it was. And we were getting, actually getting calls on a lot of suspicious uh, packages around the stadium. So after the first year, they designed some metal boxes for the equipment to be placed in strategically around the stadium. And so now, when they come in to set up for the event, they just install the equipment, it's just a metal box and it fits in with the existing infrastructure. So if you're walking by looking at it, you would not know what it was. You might think it was an electrical box or something along that line. Chemical and biological threats require special consideration and detection methods. As with all threats, 
The value of advance information from cooperative agencies is critical. I know there's a lot of technology that has been developed in, through different kinds of sniffers and um, SafeSite is one example that can be actually designed into the facility. So it's constantly monitoring and checking uh, the air. That technology continues to improve. Um, it's something that we have not deployed holistically, but we do have safe site on our, at our venue, um, and, and we have folks walking around with those types of sniffers. Um, I think there are also uh, our technological advances through dispersion analysis and other things. If you had a release of some, some toxin, you would have the ability to, to figure out how and, and, and where that might have spread within your venue through a dispersion analysis. While best practices for ingress involves individual attention to fans, egress from a stadium facility benefits by wide concourses and passages that accommodate many people. Neck down areas are potential problems. The most important thing for smooth egress are the wider ramps and trying to eliminate any type of choke points as people are getting ready to leave. Having clearly marked paths helps to direct people in the event of an evacuation. Having gates that are clearly identified that are wide, having travel paths and concourses that are wide enough to allow people to move out, and then assuring that your apron area and your buffer area around the venue is sufficient to allow those people to disperse effectively. One of the design features that has to do with accessibility and egress from the stadium are our, our ramps that are ADA compliant as well as our vertical transportation, both elevators and escalators that we have in the building. During an evacuation, uh, you want to create a clear path, a path that's visible for the uh, spectator to get out. Uh, one thing that we do is we have additional exit gates that aren't used for entry that we open up to clear the concourse. Because as those people are uh, exiting out the vomitoriums onto the concourse, you start getting the bottleneck. And if they're trying to get back to the entrance that they came in, it might not be the same, it might not be the closest. Well, clearly the width of aisles, uh, the width of portals, concourses are all important. Having as generous a space as you can afford is, is really crucial. The amount of time that ties people up in, in the means of egress is, uh, is really a direct function of the physical space that they have to get out of the building. So the wider it is, the faster potentially they can, they can evacuate uh, in mass safely. I mean, you want an evacuation to be slow and methodical, but not so slow that it's uh, uh, that they're being tied up by other patrons or, or that uh, you have choke points. Every facility has its limitations. Communication with fans via signage, scoreboard directions, and readily accessible maps help direct people to the best egress for their particular section. We have uh, good communications through our 12th man uh, video board. The, uh, th that gives us an instant link to, to all the fans in the stadium. Uh, and so we can put up emergency messages uh, and, and we can take feedback from fans. Another aspect that we've learned now that we've moved into our expanded stadium is we really need a video that enhances people's understanding of exit routes. So we've done a, a video that we play before the game that graphically shows people how to move out of the stadium and how it relates to where they're sitting. Stadium personnel, perhaps on elevated platforms along concourses, provide human direction and can be most effective. I think also by design, you want to create some spaces where your crowd control managers can be uh, to direct crowd that's out of the flow of traffic but still provides visibility. And probably the best way to do that is f through some kind of an elevated platform so that they can rise above the crowd and direct patrons out of the, the venue, but do that in, a, in an area or a way that they're out of the flow of traffic. Access to medical facilities might be important. First aid station should be located uh, obviously easily accessible by the fans and your patrons. They should be clearly marked. And you also want to consider the size of the uh, room that you use because if you have a situation where you have not necessarily mass casualties but say a heat related incident where you have a uh, higher than normal amount of people requiring first aid, you want to have enough space to be able to triage those individuals. So they should be located on, if you have multiple concourses or levels, they should be located on each level and then clearly marked. We've strategically placed ambulances in certain areas around the stadium 
to be able to quickly transport people if that becomes a need, an immediate need to be able to move those people very quickly. So that eliminates a long way to take the patients from the actual treatment area back to where the ambulances are located. First of all is uh, access. I think it's important to be able to have access for either the spectators but also for the emergency responders. Um, the other thing is capacity. Um, you know, again, we have 87,000 people that come to a game. And I think also locations, um, you know, it's uh, like, a lot like real estate location is extremely important because uh, um, if you have the majority of your uh, spectators uh, on one side of your stadium but a very small first aid station or a single first aid station on that side, uh, that would not be good. All of these factors may be incorporated into stadium design. It's imperative that your game day management, your public safety staff, and even your ushers, your ticket takers, all are familiar with the design of the facility. They should know ingress and egress, and you should uh, practice that. You have, for in our case, we have seven home football games a year. That's an excellent opportunity to practice different techniques and things. It's imperative that the entire staff is very familiar with the design of the facility. Training scenarios, tabletop exercises, and simulations all play a key role in functioning efficiently within any sports architecture. We um, see every event as an exercise. We plan every event as an exercise, um, just like if we were setting up for uh, an exercise to test our active shooter or, or response to a chemical. Um, we see every event in, in that way that we do the planning through the ICS, we involve everybody, we test parts of the plan, different games we, we will put into play where we'll have them do the exit route and we'll call them on the radio and have the officers position themselves for all out um, and have them acknowledge that they got the, the word. Um, we also do after actions. Biggest thing of after actions is we include everybody. We get from the, the kick ticket taker up to the uh, bag checker to the police chief. They, they will give us what they see as an issue, what went well, what didn't go well, and we look at those and we see how we could fix it. One underlying design principle in all that has been discussed during this program is the importance of designing for the future. Not only fan capacity, but media growth, technology, safe areas, and other important factors. Perhaps the most critical human or operational underlying principle is that of ongoing communications between agencies and organizations. 9-11 has taught us a valuable lesson in that regard. Well, no one has all the answers. It's very important to listen to other people to get ideas um, so that you can go take those back to your, your facility and make improvements. At Ohio State, we were actually using the Unified Command, which is now known as National Incident Management System or Incident Command System, NIMS, ICS. Prior to 9-11, that was just out of necessity, having tw over 20 different agencies and departments, both within the university, both internal and external agencies, other law enforcement agencies, all public safety agencies. It was important to have that Unified Command. It's a university event in the university uh, leadership is in charge of that event, but having all those other agencies, you needed a unified command to manage the event, and that's still important today. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud about this community, uh, this state, and this university are the way that, that our folks work together. We work together not just at the stadium, but we plan together, we exercise together, and we respond to real emergencies together, and we make uh, I think all of the, the features of the stadium and the, the positives and negatives of, of the stadium and the game day crowd, we make it work. Without having ICS or that NIMS platform in place, it would be almost impossible for us to coordinate the number of people and resources that we have. Uh, we have a game day plan, we have an operational manual, we, have, we complete all of the necessary ICS forms for game days to be able to identify uh, what our resources are, who's tasked with certain things, and probably most importantly, we look at that span of control that we're utilizing those resources for. So not only are we using the forms to be able to track everything, but we're looking back to see who's responsible for what specifically in each one of those areas of the stadium. You are not alone. There are resources and experienced humans to help you with almost all issues you will face in the design of a new facility or the upgrade of an old one. 
The American Clearinghouse for Educational Facilities, ASEF, is available online, by phone, and in person in many cases. They have the connections and information to steer you in the right direction. The National Center for Spectator Sports Safety and Security, NCS4, has contacts with security and safety personnel across the country. It is a fabulous resource. Well, NCS4, the National Center for Spectator Sports Safety and Security at the University of Southern Miss, is a, a, a center that was uh, created in 2006 to really support cutting edge uh, research, uh, uh, international training. We have created uh, over the last uh, eight years many uh, FEMA courses to be delivered uh, to first responders mostly at university settings. Uh, we have created a national sports security laboratory in which we do uh, vet different technologies, different models, different processes to see if we can uh, look at best practices and, 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 and hopefully have some solutions for the end users. Uh, recently we established an institute for the study of sport incidents and that's very important because we'll, we'll be able to start in next year collect critical data on incidents that occur at stadiums and arenas all over the world so that we can start to a baseline where what's really occurring in the industry. We hope you have found this program helpful. Please contact ASAF or NCS4 with any need you have relative to stadium design or security. And remember, in the wake of a crisis, the difference between victim and victor, reactionary or responder, is usually the level of advanced preparedness.